So at the end of the day, a lot of my work is about being saying, look, these are complex times, music, art, literature, we need to reflect on that and just think of it as, as a starting point rather than a, a, a portal that's closed. Joining us today, very, very excited to have Paul Miller, AKA DJ Spooky. Hey, what's up? Uh, you know, everyone wants to know your name. I didn't do the background, the, res the required background check on you. <laughs> How did, who gave you the handle, DJ well, Spooky? Well, yeah, you know, my name's Paul Miller, and one of the things that always comes to mind when I look at my nickname is that it was a little bit of a college situation where I thought that I would probably just do this as a fun little intervention while I was in school look at it as a kind of, um, you know, just fun college situation that spilled over to real life and then kept going. Um, so yeah, DJ Spooky is basically meant to be when you press play and there's nobody there. It's like a sense of irony, a sense of um, just uh, how people think of when you have recorded sound, you know, it's just one of those things where we live in an era where recordings have defined modern life. And that's, you know, the real deal. I mean, you press play on anything, YouTube, turntable.fm, Spotify, you're dealing with the world immersed in recordings. So the Germans would call that unheimlich or uncanny. You know, Sigmund Freud liked to call the idea of the disembodied voice or the right. idea of a displaced memory. Um, at the same time, I majored in philosophy and French literature. So to make a long story short, it was kind of a sense of humor to just condense a lot of what I just said into one word, DJ Spooky. Right. You know, too. You know, I guess I was thinking this morning, Paul, at what point in the time continuum did the DJ really take over the, the live music scene? Because, you know, you, you, go to, you go to culture events, now the DJ is more prominent than bands. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I'd say in the 90s there was a lot of transition because you, you had two things, really big things happen. One. Uh, memory became cheaper and so you could pack a lot more material and information and data into the everyday objects uh, and meanwhile uh, the recording industry uh, was taking a big hit because everybody thought that CDs would displace albums actually albums are now coming back as a, co a collector's item in a really big way so um, and sometime around I'd say 96 97 there was a really big tipping point which is when people started realizing that the recording meant more to their life than a lot of times seeing the live band. Although live music's not coming back as well. But in the 90s, there was a kind of quirky transition because pop culture machinery, the 20th century's idea of the, the, you know, the manufacture of pop, all of that, I just think it became democratized because more and more people had the tools to be able to dig into everything, make their own version of things, uh, edit, transform, and then above all, reappropriate you know, anything around them. So, yeah, I'd say 97, uh, there was a couple seminal moments. Yeah, the Big Bang is 97. Yeah. Okay. You know, and, and I also think that the, the labels failed to address this. They were still stuck in this kind of these, these lumbering dinosaurs holding on to these acts that were baby boomer and X generation acts that they could continually milk catalog out of. Yeah. Well, I mean, the archive that we live in right now in terms of 20th and 1st century, when I say we live in the archive, if you look at cloud computing, if you look at all of the things that um, signify um, almost everything that we look at now with modern wireless technology, you're always accessing the, the, the data that defines life for, right. you know, in our information economy. So you're, everything from your Facebook to your Spotify, whatever you want to call it, your taste, your preferences, the things that define many of the selections you do, Amazon.com profile, you name it. Those are things that are archival, you know? So I, I love the idea of the DJ as someone that's not just playing records, but someone who's really uh, possessed by this, this idea of archive fever. So when I went to Antarctica, one of the things I was looking at was that the entire continent is a kind of archive uh, because of the millions of years of sediment and dust that have like, gotten caught up in the ice. Um, and at the same time, uh, what that meant in terms of actually saying that 
we live in a world of interconnected, complex systems, you know? Well, you know, Malcolm Gladwell says, says you know, the, the, the new heroes, the new pop heroes are cultural connectors. They're, they're taking all of this data and they're connecting people to it who are afraid or don't have the time to do it themselves. They can't sort it out. You know, we look at the environment, we're in a really noisy environment. And you go to the South Pole, it's just the opposite, but it has a noise on a different level. Yeah, well, I'm a big fan of John Cage and the way that he opened up the notion that noise and complexity and the acceptance of that was part of the composition. So um, a lot of my work is about looking at recordings, not just as dead you know, objects, right. but as, as potentiators, things that give a kind of um, relational situation. So when you press play in a passive context, you're just going to press play on something and be kind of sitting back. But when I'm looking at DJ culture and sampling and all of the things that um, define the idea of how sampling can kind of renew memory, Antarctica is a perfect place to start because it's, it is the original you know, version of things. It's like landscape as purity, landscape as data archive, all of these things that to me conceptually speaking, it is the world's commons. You know, it's the place that we share. It's got 78% of the fresh water on the planet. Um, it's got, you know, so many variables. When you're talking about noise and complexity, the wind is incredibly fierce. You know, it's called catabatic winds. It also has a convergence of all the major ocean currents of the world. So these are hyper-complex systems. Now, if you look at noise, noise is simply a very, very complex collage of signals um, that we've decided to not assign meaning to. Um, so Antarctica is pure noise. That's my nickname for it. Pure noise. Yeah. The system. Well, what was it that drew you to the place initially? Um, I've been reading about just the idea of uh, ice in general. And um, when I say the idea of ice, I'm talking about the molecular structure. I'm talking about the relation that we have to parts per million of carbon dioxide in there, the way cloud formations set up and then dump snow. Uh, snow itself, for many obvious reasons with climate change, um, some places are experiencing floods because there's me record melt-offs of the snow. It's like a lot of my friends in Boulder, Colorado, for example, their rivers are swelling. Meanwhile, other places, weather patterns have shifted quite a bit. So how do we think about that as this notion of nature as system? And snowflakes are really great metaphors for that because they're every, every snowflake is essentially a hexagonal structure. And if you kind of dig into the molecular structure, you can see the way hexagons will keep kind of uh, transforming. Uh, just due to temperature differences. Uh, I think it's incredible so that you have this mathematics of nature and you have this intuitive relationship for that as a composer. So I'm really interested in that and I think there's some great ways to think of music as a, as a mirror to hold up to society um, and to give people a sense of potential, possibility, you know, that the, world's, the world can be a different place. You also, what I thought was very clever is, is you use the African American experience and how they define ice and how mm -hmm. they use that in, in their nomenclature to impact the message, the phrase, the, the, the you know, objectifying a DJ, <laughs> you know, as his name, as a hard name. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a funny thing because I, ice, if you look at so many of the nicknames that people have, ice tea, ice cube, vanilla ice, uh, the list goes on. Yeah, the idea of the ice grill, you know, the metaphor of coldness in our, in our society is really, it's about the, the surface, you know, right. giving people a sense of, being a cool, reflective, calm, even while being a really tense or a very hardcore person. Uh, when I say hardcore, you know, that's in our society that always implies the extreme. Um, so if you look back at the, ro the notion of cool versus cold, right? I mean, they are different metaphors. All right, birth of the cool. I'll give you a couple other names, you know, that, you know, blues, you know, you can think of this notion of the coolness of an object or something, but I was comparing that to Marshall McLuhan and this idea of hot versus cool media. So it's like the way a lecture will create more of a passive response, and McLuhan liked to call that a cool medium versus a hot medium uh, that you have to be more involved with. So in terms of Antarctica, looking at the McLuhan, this, by the way, this year is the centennial of Marshall McLuhan's, who coined the term the global village, right. and who also the created- the massage. Yeah, the media is the massage. Um, so the environment is the massage right now. Right. <laughs> and our media environment versus the natural environment. I'm really fascinated, how do you kind of navigate between the two and start thinking of the role of the artist or the writer or the musician or the creative and saying that uh, we are catalyzers. 
we can kind of well again your you cultural know. connectors to go back to Gladwell's yeah. point and you know it's interesting I was reading a story how the average suburban kid doesn't take his shoes off and run in his grass in his front yard he's in this you know hermetically sealed environment playing Xbox and you know being bombarded with messages and yet nature is swirling all around him albeit it's shrinking unfortunately because of the you know overpopulation and all the other lists of environmental concerns but just the simple notion that you could take your shoes off and walk in your backyard or walk around your neighborhood and engage in nature and disengage from the electronic overflow or excess. Yeah, no, all of the above. What's interesting is that same lawn is probably maintained and kind of bounded by chemicals, pesticides, all sorts of stuff that are toxic that then right. flow into the waters and the rivers and the people then, you know, like the Hudson just now, we had a huge fire in the Hudson's uh, waste facility processing ground. Right up here at the Harlem facility. Yeah, and uh, that spilled millions of ton uh, gallons of... Uh, and it was a minor story. Yeah. Which is very sad. And the particulate from that actually is less than the particulate uh, that comes off of a really intense rain or storm. Right. And so, it, to make a long story short, when you're saying a kid will, will not take their shoes off in the grass, they're amusing enough with the amount of pesticides that that go into the front lawn of Maybe most. healthier not. <laughs> but you know, this, yeah. this, with, as Thoreau said, get back to nature. Get yeah. back to that environment. You went to a pure environment where you know nature rules. There's yeah. no there's no settling that nature. Well, make no mistake about it. Nature rules everywhere. Well, I mean, of course. We're trying this little grid, this little park. I was putting concrete here. If we don't constantly renew and change it, nature will reclaim it within a couple oh, of years. Absolutely. Um, we can't fight it. We're part of nature, and I don't think we should. Uh, one of the big inspirations for my whole project of going to Antarctica is, uh, it's a funny thing, I went to Bowdoin College in Maine and we had this idea of the New England Transcendentalist hangover. Right. You know, Long, uh, Longfellow, uh, Walt Whitman, uh, Emerson, Thoreau, uh, and so on. And I'm a huge fan of Emerson, I'm a huge fan of, of course, the Walden Pond, stuff like that. You know, just, there's, there was a kind of a movement at the beginning of the American project the American nation state, where it was like meant to be a utopian space, but of course founded on slavery and other terrible, horrible things. But wiping out indigenous people. Yeah. <laughs> but some of the nature issues of actually trying to to deflect the worst aspects of industrialization. Right. You know, the satanic mills that Blake was talking about were, you know, they were popping up in the U.S., but we had just bigger rivers and bigger spaces. And Thoreau and Emerson and Walt, you know, these guys. We're trying to figure it out very early. So anyway, that, that influenced my composition a lot. Teddy Roosevelt was a great uh, protector of the environment. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't get a lot. I, you know, New York State has the largest state park of any of the 50 states, which kind of blew my mind. Yeah, and he's also a like, major colonialist. And if you look at the American Museum of Natural History, there's a, there's a, there's a statue that turns my stomach every time I see it. It's, it's, Roosevelt with an African-American slave on one hand and an Indian on the other. You see that? It's, oh, he's riding a horse. Yeah. So it's a kind of a quirky thing because some people do good things and you do bad things. But at the end of the day, nature is the system that we are involved in. And that's how I think some of the Western model of saying that we're divorced from nature, this idea of applying human rationality to you know, the grid, the logic of putting everything into containable boxes. Compartmentalize it. That's yeah. what doesn't work. Yeah. So my music uh, that I wrote in Antarctica was a kind of response to that. And these are compositions. Uh, and the book that I did, The Book of Ice, is a, con a sort of a distillation of some of the compositions and graphic design that I did. Well, I was going to say it's a complete multimedia experience, as your work is in general. I mean, you never really look at it, again, as a compartmentalized. You look at it as a very organic whole. Yeah. So Very wide uh, view. And I try. I mean, these are, these are complex times, and there's a lot of noise at every level, all puns intended, you know. Noise in the system of politics, and the system of the synchronizing of the lights here, of the rivers, of the air currents. So I think a composer or an artist should really look at the world as their palette. And some of my favorite, you know, artists, people like Jackson Pollock or even Andy Warhol, their environment, you know, influenced the work at every level. But my environment now is hyper-globalization, digital aesthetics, you know, network systems, Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you know, it was funny. I, th I thought the one word that really 
I think is the buzzword it's always been for me for the last three or four years is this convergence. Yeah. It's, it's, we are in the time of convergence on so many levels. But you know, the one of the person, the composer who really kind of championed that term was Wagner. He had a term called Gesamtkunstwerk. Right. But Duke Ellington was one of my favorite conceptualists and as well. And his street is yeah. right behind us. Duke, Duke Ellington, Ellington Boulevard. Street. Yeah, Boulevard. Lived around the corner. And um, he, he had a series of projects called A Tone Poem for Harlem which was meant to be kind of a conceptual piece where he wanted to define the sound of Harlem in composition. So there's different uh, angles from both the African-American and the European-American. Uh, the fusion, I think, that ends up happening. America is basically a huge collision between Africa and Europe, you know, with a large dash of Asia that, that got kind of thrown in in the mix as well. So we're a hybrid culture, and we always have been, but we just need to admit it. Uh, this, the compositions I wrote in Antarctica are, are both based on European, you know, t classical music tuning systems, meets hip hop, meets the, the, the mathematics of nature. Um, and I'm working with different quantum uh, physicists like uh, Brian Greene. He wrote this book, The Elegant Universe. Um, all of which is to say that I'm looking at being unapologetically complex. And I was going to ask you that. Are you ever in fear of losing? A segment of the audience who may find you too erudite or you know, yeah, too people, well read I, and like, oh, DJ Spooky, I, I, you know, how do I, where's my entry point, you know? Yeah. No, I have haters, I have people who are like, why don't you just play music or why don't yeah. you, you why know, don't you like, do what you did in college? Yeah, I mean, it's just like, so at the end of the day, a lot of my work is about being, saying, look, these are complex times, music, art, literature, we need to reflect on that and just think of it as, as a starting point rather than a, a, a portal that's closed. Um, so I use art, the arts, math, science, you name it, to kind of say these are um, experiences, you know, it's not about a passive situation. And taking a studio, going to several of the main ice fields in Antarctica, or going, recently I went to the high Arctic near the North Pole, um, you know, just, just to say, you know, why not? Um, the problem is very few people in America travel outside the U.S very small amount have passports and many people just travel to just within the 50 states and so on. Or they just travel within a 50 mile radius of their own home. You know, I had yeah. this conversation with Michael Fronte a couple of years ago and yeah. I was I was saddened to hear that even U.S. Senators don't have passports. Yeah, look at, look <laughs> at Sarah Palin. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's extraordinary that they have no, and you know, part of the glory of Obama was he was going to try to institute this national pride and program Maybe instead of going right into college, you do a national service to the Peace Corps, Doctor Without Borders, and you really get kids into a global mindset. Yeah. And at the same time, don't forget Bush is from one of the wealthiest families in the U.S. And he had hit, before he was president, he only left the country twice. Twice, I know. Yeah. We, I, so, I, it, it's just extraordinary. But so how are those people going to tell you anything? How can they tell you about the international view of but, not having the experience? But at the same time, I think the artists can distill a lot of these experiences and bring it back for people. I mean, not everybody's going to be... In fact, I wouldn't want everyone to go to Antarctica. Uh, I was going to ask you about the expedition itself. You, you had to charter a Russian vessel yeah. when you went to South, uh, the South Pole. I mean, the funding of all of this, did you, were you met with a lot of resistance? Or because of the status of your projects and the scale of your projects, was it easy to find uh, the money? No, I mean, I paid for it myself. And what I ended up doing was then viewing that as an investment in the project and kind of like... Recoup it over time. Yeah, recoup it over time. Yeah. yeah. And, and when you went to, when you approached the publishers, they, was there a hard sale on this or did they get it? No, they really were into it. And um, everything's been pretty smooth sailing. The main resistance I had was from bureaucracies, like the National Science Foundation. And really? Everything. Yeah. They, they weren't keen on having the project, which is fine. So if I was an artist that was just going to humbly accept that, then I wouldn't be where I, you know, I am today. So I said, all right, screw that. We ended up finding a Russian vessel, right. uh, made, negotiated with them, chartered it, and had the product done. But a lot of people, I, this is my thing, is a lot of artists will be a little bit too dependent on uh, bureaucracies and getting, getting grants and stuff. A little and, too beholden, so they really won't apply their full vision to a project. Yeah, and you have to be very creative with how you get funding and how you set things up. You don't want to be edited before you even start your project. Yeah. Yeah, I try as much as possible to say that you, you have a sense of agency. And that's where my music, uh, you know, kind of points the way towards that. But again, it's, it's unapologetically complex. It's not going to be for everybody. 
And, you know, it was one of those things where I really, as much as humanly possible, wanted to figure out some ways of um, looking at the, the paradox of the urban. You know, what happens when you pull a composer who's based on, you know, the sound of the city out of the city, you know, and then hit the reset button on the imagination. So hip-hop, jazz, drum and bass, dubstep, rock, those are all musics of the city. And as a composer, going to the most extreme part of the planet and pulling out of everything, that's what I wanted to try and kind of... Do you really feel like you've grabbed it? Uh, or is it a work in progress? It's a work, every, well, life is a work in progress. There's no, it's never finished. Right. But I'm a big fan of saying, you know, let's see about a paradox. And I think, when I say paradox, like pulling someone from the heart of downtown New York and putting them in the middle of the South Pole, that's about as, as paradoxical. <laughs> <laughs> That's something worthy of Plato, man. You know, well, well, let's talk about the, the politics of that paradox. Here's a, here's a land mass that is, isn't beholden to any large sovereign nation. No claim to it anyway. I guess maybe small uh, research facilities, but it's its own continent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, there's no government. There's no control mechanism except for the Antarctic Treaty that was signed in 1959 and whose signatories um, basically all agreed to not have a militarized situation in Antarctica. It's one of the most visionary documents of the mid-20th century, actually. Uh, that and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, you know, when you think about when people finally agree, hey, you know what, maybe it's not good to treat people horribly and we can all sign this little document called the Declaration of Human Rights. You know, and maybe it's not so good to, you know, pollute the atmosphere and destroy and have nuclear radiation in your food and mercury in your fish. Maybe we can all sign a document saying, I don't even know what would be a, a, the equivalent of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I mean, you can look at Kyoto, what happened with that. It ain't happening, man. So we need to figure out something to give people... I think the environment, when you talk about the city, when you talk about nature, when you talk about Antarctica, these are all places where there, there's a lot of potential to do good and there's a lot of potential to do devastating harm. I think we've covered a lot today, Paul. I think right. we've got enough to well, cut up. Easy. Paul Miller, oh. DJ Spooky. The Book of Ice. Re we didn't even talk about Rebirth of a Nation and all of your other <laughs> oh projects. My God. You Google the guy, yeah. believe me. It'll keep you very busy. And, you know, just as a way of just representing a little sound. Oh, let's tell your, your, your uh, URL. Okay. Uh, yeah, my website's djspooky.com. has lots of mixes, downloadables, um, video clips, sound clips. Above all, um, a lot of the work I'm doing over the next couple months is going to be about remoteness and slowness. So. I'm going to be spending a lot of time in the South Pacific. And, um, you know, Vanuatu has been rated as one of the happiest places on Earth. And I'm really interested in seeing this idea of, the, again, a, a dialectical tension, you know, between the urban and the remote. There's well, such a, an interesting indigenous people who really, they don't fit the stereotype of, of the Samoans or... Yeah, they're very, or, very unique, specific. Very, very unique. Yeah, yeah and that's a beautiful thing to see and, and to support. So yeah. there we go, 2011. Thank you all. All right. All right. See you soon.